Club on BBC Radio Ulster and BBC Radio Foil. Hello and you're very welcome to another session of the best of folk and traditional music. I'm Colm Sands. Well, it's nearly time to meet a woman who has left many to door on her travels with accordion as a member of bands like the Posies and Swap. She has travelled the world in many musical combinations, but just recently she got around to releasing a totally solo album called Essentially Invisible to the Eye. And during a visit to these parts recently, she told me about some of the paths she has travelled since setting out on the road literally in a marching accordion band. She's a fine musician and well able to tell a story or two as well as you're about to hear. But we'll have a few tunes first and then meet up with the woman herself, Karen Tweed. playing two reels, dinkies and the convenience reel, Karen Tweed in full flight there. Delighted to say that Karen is joining us on the programme. You're very welcome, Karen. How are you doing? I'm very well. It's great to be here. Thanks, Colin. Now, those tunes we just heard were recorded a good few years ago. And since then, you've travelled the world with the accordion. I think one of your first journeys was across the Irish Sea to win an All-Ireland title. Tell us, though, how it all started and where it all started. It started in Wellingborough, Northamptonshire. I was born in London but moved from London when I was three because my parents, they the whole of the factory that they worked with, the company, they moved up to this place, Wellingborough, Northamptonshire, which is now a kind of commuter area because it's between... It's about 45 minutes to get to London on the train from it. But at that time, it was a very quiet Northamptonshire village and a lot of London people moved up to what was called a London overspill estate, So, which is why I still speak with a bit of a London accent, and even though I shouldn't really. The other thing that happened was there was St Mark's Hall, which was a little church hall just up from where we lived. This guy called Joe Cole came to teach, and my sister went along for accordion lessons and she came back with this instrument and I just fell in love with the instrument, which you would, of course, you know, because it was so amazing. So I asked if I could also go for lessons and my dad said you're only allowed to go for lessons for six months and if you don't get a shining report no more music lessons and you've got to share the accordion with your sister and Joe was actually teaching accordion to groups of children in order to recruit them into his marching band he was based in Corby which is a big Scottish town kind of area had the steelworks a lot of Scottish people came down to work to the steelworks and it was known as Little Scotland and uh, he had a marching band there and I joined his marching band and marched for hours and hours on a Saturday with this huge 120 bass because you don't question the fact you've got 10 kilos of accordion on your back at 11 years of age but it was great and it taught me a lot about rhythm because you can't you have to walk and play in rhythm 
And uh, when your you whole body is involved in the playing Absolutely. when you're walking. Absolutely. And you know, he was very strict on. There was a guy called Mr. Chard who used to do the chore- help do the choreography, and you do these figures of eights, and you'd have. And it was the complete real marching band thing with the big bass drums at the back and the mace bearer at the front, and and snare drums and the whole bit, you know. Can um, you? You've got the accordion with you. Could you cast your mind back and somehow recreate a, a few bars of one of the tunes you might have played? <laughs> yeah. So you'd be playing uh, the first tune we learned. <laughs> And so on, you know. Yes. And you play that and you'd walk to it and you'd have yeah. to walk in time. And they were absolute sticklers for complete precision. And, uh, and I still get people coming to me now and saying, oh, I used to be in the same accordion band as you, you know. And I have the photos and that to prove it. And so a great, yeah. a great starting place. Was there some point then where you made the next direction, as, as it was, into playing more reels and jigs? And yeah, I mean, Joe, Joe taught me a lot of Irish music. And uh, he had a word with my father and said, you know, Karen needs kind of pushing more now. He was he was a very generous, very generous teacher. And so um, I went to some classical teachers, fell out with them all, like you do, because they were calling Irish music buskers stuff, and I wasn't having any of that, of course. <laughs> and then I met up with uh, a chap called John Whelan. The, he was the most influential Irish music teacher I had, and he plays button accordion. He didn't... He didn't read music at the time. I'm not sure he still can. Everything was done by ear, and we did it bar at a time. We spent three hours on a bar. He'd play me the bar. I'd play it back to him. He'd go, no, nope, play it again, and we'd do and that. And he would hours. say, as I've always listened to how, how I play it. Yeah, and yeah. at the time, I was, um, I was very interested in art and design at school. So I'd done a lot of kind of still life drawing where you look at negative space because the space be around what you're trying to draw is as important as the, the object you're trying to draw. And he spoke a lot at that time of, of the space between the notes is more important than the notes. So where, how you place the note, what emphasis you put on the note, all about the phrasing. If you listen to singers, listen how they phrase it. Where do you take the breath? It was phenomenal. And I still use John's methodology of teaching today, which is basically... It's about listening. If you don't listen, you're never going to understand how things work. And then he went to America and he said to me, I was about 16 at the time, and he said, "Uh, you don't need a teacher really now because you're starting to sound too much like me and that's a bad thing. You don't want to sound like John Whelan, you want to sound like Karen Tweed. And he said to do that, he said, I want you to put all of your LPs, which at that time was Finbar Dwyer, Jackie Daly, Joe Burke, you know, all of that stuff up in the loft and don't listen to accordion music for at least five years. And when you go into a session and if there's an accordion player in it that's one accordion too many, you're not to join. Even if people call you a snob, you're not to do it. And he said, base your learning of music on the real, what he called the real music of Ireland, which was the singing, the pipes, the flute and the fiddle. So I chose fiddles Mm -hmm. and I've been very interested in fiddle music. So their bow is my bellows and how they phrase a tune. I would I would sit for hours. Fascinating how you kind of looked so intensely and and clearly into it all. But before we go on maybe to the next chapter in your life, would Mm -hmm. there be any of those tunes just even a bit of them that you remember oh yeah I, I remember the first tune John, John, when I went to John for lessons I remember the first uh, <laughs> the first time I went to him and I practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced the Box of Oran Moor you know yeah. and I was really proud of my, my rendition of the Box of Oran Moor and I played it to him and it was in his kitchen in, in Houghton Regis in Dunstable and he looked at me and he, he had a pause and he said let's start again shall we <laughs> you know? and I was devastated I was so devastated but he was right of course you know I was playing it I don't know how I was playing it but it wasn't very well yeah. anyway so he put me down the first tune one of the first tunes he put me down was um and it was the way he played it so I took that home on a cassette and I had to learn that for the next lesson. And then we went back and we dissected it bar by bar and he told me why I hadn't listened to it properly. I started going to him, I think it was in the November, and around Christmas time my mum met up with John and she said, how's Karen doing? And he said, oh, she's doing fine. And, and uh, she said, but is she going to go in for the regional flour? And he said, oh, yeah, he said, she'll win the All-Island. And my mum said, what, next year? And he said, no, this year this year and my mum went you're joking and he said no no I'm not joking and he was a real stickler that if you went in for a flower you did your three tunes and then you had to learn a, a new three tunes for the next flower you could never ever it was absolutely not allowed to play the same three tunes at any flower and I knew a lot of people who played the same three tunes every single flower yes. and they had them well practiced and all of that stuff but no that was no 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 no. and the first all island I went into which was the Ennis flower in 1977 and I remember my name on the program was Kieran Tweed right which was funny anyway and I played and John waited around and then as soon as I finished playing 
He left the competition. He left the building. And Mum was really disgusted. And then at the end of the competition, they announced I'd won, you see. And uh, she went off and she found John in the town. And he was just with friends, you know. And she said... Um, Karen won. He says, yeah, I know. He said, did you hear? He said, no, I knew. As soon as she played, I knew she'd win. You know? And he was so confident. He yeah. was just so confident because he'd won five All-Ireland Championships at that point and he understood what was needed to win mm. an All-Ireland. It's a technique, like all competitions are. And I'm not berating the flowers. I think flowers are great, but there's nothing more unnatural than walking into a room, sitting down, playing your best without having warmed up, without saying hello to anybody, without having a cup of tea, it's, it's about mm. as unnatural as classical music exams mm. are. But he understood what they were looking for. He understood mm. what was needed. And he prepared and he, you for it. Yeah, and he mm. heard it and he walked out and he went, yeah, that's fine, that'll do. That was like, like a, a, one of the underage titles in 77 and you went on and won the yeah, senior in 82. Yeah. I mean, there's so many things you've done in your life musically. Uh, probably there would be a few steps before coming to your work with bands like the Posies. But mm -hmm. when you look back on those days and you, you made some great recordings together, is there, is there any track in particular that you recorded with the Posies that we could have a, a little listen to that you would recommend? Uh, there's lots, of course, but I'd like to choose Daniel's Potatoes. It's called Daniel's Potatoes because the Gaelic song in it is all about potatoes. And I love Gaelic songs because they're about proper themes, potatoes, trousers, that kind of thing, you know. <laughs> we have this tune from a trumpet player called Daniel from Canada, brilliant trumpet player, and one of his tunes. And uh, I believe there's a tune from Maura Brannock on it as well. I think I've got the right yeah. set. That should have been a hornpipe until Ailey got hold of it and wanted to play it at the speed of sound, which in the key of F is not the easiest on the piano accordion. But anyway, she coerced me into it. And, it's, and it, again, it's that great thing of tune into song into tune yeah. and the poosies were great at that <laughs> I'm gonna get a little bit of 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 a little b
Daniel's Potatoes, the sound of the posies there with Karen Tweed among the throng on accordion and Karen <laughs> with us on the programme here tonight with the piano accordion on her knee for all emergencies. Karen, you talked there about just changing tempos of tunes and things like that. At some point in, in your career, you, you find yourself playing in countries like Finland and having a great interest in the, the music of Scandinavia, I believe. Yeah, that was all down to Catherine Tickell. I was in the Poozies and it was a kind of part-time band because everybody else had other jobs, really. I was a teacher at the time and uh, an art teacher. And uh, then I, I suddenly joined the Catherine Tickell band and, uh, of course, met the great Ian Carr in that band. And we had a tour of Sweden, and we'd been driving around Sweden for about four nights, not hearing the slightest sniff of a traditional Swedish tune, just doing concerts. And we ended up at, early at this sound check in Falun, and these fiddle players had just finished doing a children's workshop, and we implored them to play us a Polska. And it was Karina Normanson and Ulla Ekstrom, who I ended up working with in Swap with, oh, with yeah. Ian. And uh, it was so beautiful what they played. And Karina then did this Kulning thing, which is this mad screaming thing they do in, in Sweden to call the cows. Uh, Catherine burst into tears because it was so beautiful. It was just so amazing. And uh, Is it a musical call to the cows? It is. It's kind of a little bit like the yodelling thing oh, yeah. where they call across the water. And actually the cows know your sound. And men do it and women do it. But it's, it's, it's kind of a way of this high-pitched noise that they send across the mountains and their, their sheep or cows will come back to them. And it does work. We were on Offers Dyke one time with Swap and Ian said to Karina, go on, try the cow calling, you know. And we were like, yeah, 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 it won't work. And she just did this thing and all these cows came over. <laughs> it was great. Maybe they would have come anyway. I don't know. It's a different part of your throat, and it's, it is a very high pitch thing. And what and Karina, you, <laughs> I'm, I'm not a very, a very good singer, and she used to um, pull me out of the car sometimes when we were in Sweden in the depths of winter, and we'd, and she'd, we'd run into the forest while the boys are in the car, in the snow, and she'd go, right, this is when we do it. <laughs> and it's like, and you've got to give all your longing and all of your passion and all of your whatever you really, really are crying for, grieving for, that's what you're letting out in this noise, you know. And uh, I'm too English. It's very difficult to give out that amount of passion at, at that time in the 90s. You know, I'm a bit yeah. different now. I don't care anymore. But and, and the interesting thing about working in Swedish music is the Swedes and the Irish, I think, are quite similar in that when they sing a lot of songs, they've got a lot of songs about sadness and about people emigrating and people going away and losing loved ones, that the Swedes don't see it as um, a terrible thing. They celebrate longing. They celebrate grief. It's a good thing to show somebody you love them so much that your heart's breaking for them. And there's a kind of joy in it, which, you know, I'd never seen that before. It was amazing. And then when I look back at the kind of emigration songs of Ireland and, the, and a lot of, I'm a big Dolores Keane fan, for example, and you listen to the way Dolores can sing those songs and Sandra Joyce and people like that, 
And it is a real longing. It's a real heartfelt mm. passion that is unleashed. And maybe we can't do that in spoken word is easy, but we can do it in song. And it, it's what is the stuff that makes you cry. It's the stuff that mm. puts those hairs on, on the back of your neck. Anyway, so, yeah, so me and Ian decided we had to have, find a way of working with Ool and Karina. It's just like that's what we had to do. So there's a lot of letters written and a lot of phone calls. But I remember it took me and Ian most of that first rehearsal, which was about six hours, just to learn one Polska because it's so different. The timing is different because the emphasis is not on the one, it's on the three. It's like you're playing music inside out. And the tonality is so weird i mean it's not like indian music either it's just it's just a totally different weird set of scales would, really. would you be able to give even a little bit of a like an irish polka and then a bit of a polska yeah. from sweden just to, by yeah. way of showing the difference absolutely so um and a polka is kind of in two or four timing and a polska is in three timing so a polska is kind of nearer to a waltz but that's where it ends because it, you even do it as a couple dance like a waltz except the man is always one beat behind the woman so it's it's anyway it's very complicated they have long nights over there you know <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so that's your polka kind of thing as you might hear it and, and carry exactly and uh, but then the, the polska thing would be um have this major minor thing happening. Beautiful, like yes, that minor gives it a lonesome feel, doesn't very, it? Very, yeah. very much so. But it's a c kind of celebratory lonesome feel. It's saying, you know, I'm really sad for whatever reason, but it's sometimes you need to feel sad because then you know what true happiness feels like. Yes, and, and, and just to uh, acknowledge you're sad and let it out rather than yeah. wallowing in it, I suppose. Yeah. It's, and it's you letting know, it out, yeah. Exactly, and in Sweden and Finland, you know, you've got these massive, massive open landscapes. And what was the, Ian Carr used to say that Sweden was twice the land mass of Great Britain with a population of Greater Manchester. So to get your head around that, of course they have a lot of open space, a lot, of course they have a lot of time on their own. Not everybody lives in Stockholm or Malmö or wherever. Mm. There's a lot of people living out in the country. And when we say out in the country, we mean you might not have a neighbour for 10 miles. And they get into their winter and they get into their darkness and it's a very, very quiet thing and it's... For people outside of Scandinavia, it's, it's very hard to get into. I mean, I find it a little bit too oppressive. Yeah. But there's also a beauty in it. You know, there's a beauty of looking out over a landscape in the morning that is totally white and has not been touched by anything. No animal, nothing. Incredible. Yeah, you know. it must be beautiful. And you, you mentioned earlier on there, Karen, that you don't sing, although you did sing with the Pussies, and you can sing, but you, you speak with the accordion. And you brought out an amazing album, uh, essentially invisible to the eye. And it's almost like your life story in music. And people who will have the chance to go along to see you, because I know you're going on tour, and hopefully you'll be over here. There, there's a segment of that where you play for about 40 50 minutes mm -hmm. with, without a break listening to the album I mean you, you just find yourself moving across landscapes and through all sorts of emotions as you listen that that must have been a, a huge job for you to, to pick the, the songs and the tunes that you were going to play well it was I've been putting it off for years you know yeah. I'm very inspired by you Bruce Chris Wood people like that who do the solo thing and before that Christy Moore and all these kind of people mm. Paul Brady who I think are just you know and it's different, I think, if you sing, but it's still the same thing. There's nothing to hide behind. It doesn't matter if you've got a song. You're very vulnerable. And I think it was the right time for me to feel vulnerable. I'd done all the collaborations and I'd worked loads with Tima Alakatilo in Finland and learned so much. And, and I still work with him. He's a great, a great asset. But he's always been pushing me, saying, 
do a solo thing, do a solo thing, you know, it'll be brilliant. And everybody had this faith in me, but for me, I couldn't do it until I found something else to say, which wasn't what Sharon Shannon does or Phil Cunningham, you know. Not that I've got anything against them, I think they're brilliant musicians, but I need to do something that's me and Mm. that is what I'm interested in. Anyway, so I was just kind of picking out tunes and working on it over about two years and I kind of honed down the whole list and all of the tunes on the album are very specifically picked because they, for me, say a lot about either a circumstance or something happening in my life or my mother or a relative or a friend. And sometimes the circumstances are not so nice and sometimes they're they're a little bit edgy or I've fallen out with somebody or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. But the whole point is that the tunes themselves and the order that they are in they have a a story behind them and so i'm telling a story but for the audience it's for them to have a listen to and make up their own minds what it is i was just thinking there you know while i was listening to you talking about all the things you've done with the accordion and the pictures you paint just going to throw this at you i suppose someone listening now is thinking of taking up an instrument and they're maybe thinking it'll be the fiddle or the flute or illin pipes or something like that if you were to just sit there now with the accordion and think for a few minutes and play something that would say to people this is within a piano accordion that you might not necessarily get in other instruments what what would you play that's a really good question
Beautiful. <laughs> Karen Tweed, thanks so much for taking us on that musical journey. That was just beautiful. And for listeners who haven't come across Karen Tweed, there's, there's more journeys like that on her album, Essentially Invisible to the Eye. And there'll be a chance, I'm sure you're going to come over here and play it. If anybody has a shed or an allotment or a little village hall they'd like me to come and play in, that's the kind of places I'm looking at. And small <laughs> old churches, just um, contact me through the website. Of Karen, thanks very much. You're very welcome. It's great to be here. <laughs> The music and the stories of the wonderful Karen Tweed and it's with another little taster from her new album Essentially Invisible to the Eye that I take my leave for another week. Many thanks for your company this evening. I hope you've enjoyed the music and I look forward to meeting up with you again at the same time next Saturday night. Till then, from producer Joanne Murphy and from me, Colm Sands, a very good night to you all. Thank you.